Now, this has been, uh, this is a passion of, of my pastor, Pastor James Nash. And I saved him for, for last because he always lets his guests go. Uh, he lets his guests go first. Uh, Robin and I will take our time uh, once everyone once everyone has spoken because we're gonna open the floor up uh, briefly for some questions from you all if you have questions for anybody on the panel but before we do that we want to let we want to hear from our own pastor James Nash. One of the things I, I, I would like to express is very important is to get into the schools because I think it will, it will serve the public and the people and the teachers, administrative staff of the schools, if, if there's a kid that's in the school and the parents or the family know that this kid has a possibility of, of, of acting out, uh, maybe being violent, I really think that that parent should tell that teacher, we got too many teachers leaving the professional because of the action of these kids. So we need to get into the schools, and, and I, I uh, took the young ladies here to three schools, and, and they were very receptive. So that's what we want to work on, try to get them into the school, and like Brother Bryan said, to prevent them from getting to the court. Uh, the judge is the last person I want these kids to see. So we got to work on them before they get to that point, and we're going to need help from the families, uh, the entire community. So that's a very important issue, is getting into these schools where these kids act out their behavior. So I want to cut off here because it, it, this has been so important that I want you to have some questions uh, for these panelists and I can't tell you enough about Judge Crocker. Let me say this right quick. Oftentimes we get such a bad image of judges. They're uncaring, they're cool and calculated, they don't want to help. But you've got judges, she operates a mental health court now, one of the things that encouraged me, we had Judge Emmett on, the, on, on, our, on our show, and he said that he will never ever stop trying to get more funding for that program. That's good news for me. So we're going to do this. We're going to turn it back to our host, uh, uh, Ms. King, and then she can feel some questions from you guys, all right? Thank you for coming. Life's cool. I'm over here, but I will have a question here. I mean, is there a certain age maybe that is... Um, dominates more as far as uh, when they reach that age that they fall into a depression. I've known two individuals who um, entered college and I don't know what happened. And, they, and it didn't run in their family, but they d fell into deep depression. And you mentioned college, and, but you were there, and I don't know what triggers it, or is it maybe just the stress of something different, being away from home? Thank you for your question. Um, unfortunately, there's no magic or set age where people do start to experience symptoms. However, she did mention college. If you think about the lifespan and the, and the developmental span of youth and children, puberty happens. So hormones are kind of all over the place naturally. And then typically with college, you go into a new place, a foreign land. There's a whole different world that you may not be accustomed to. There's life changes that you encounter. There's still those hormone changes. There's maybe some financial things, maybe home things. So I think there's just a combination. With bipolar and schizophrenia, some of the more severe mental illnesses, you typically see early onset, late teens, early 20s. That's when most people kind of start having those triggers. However, studies have shown that ADHD and other disorders similar to that may also trigger later onsets of bipolar disorder. I think when you start adding in the cultural dynamics of the family, the, the real reality, we know today that 50% of all marriages end in divorce. So it depends on that age range that that child has been exposed possibly, which is environmental. We also know that some of our families now are not even in a normal quote unquote defined family role. Then we know that there are significant numbers of individuals who have been abused at certain levels. You saw the incident where the four-year-old was killed. They've now charged two of the caregivers. There are so many variables, as she said, that impact a child prior to the age of 11 or 12 years old. Now, what they do know, and a large number of, of uh, studies are showing that between that time period, that second stage of development, possibly 10, 11, 12, 13, into the teens, 
children have this unique ability to mask their behavior. Then they, but they acted out in other ways, like in the school, like Pastor Nash was saying, other things. And then at the same time, when that person now reaches that maturity level like you were talking about, it hits you like a brick wall. So you got so many levels. The one assurance we do understand, however, we got so much evidence-based research, material, methodologies. That's why it's no reason for everybody to not at least be aware so that when you see the earliest signs in your child, whether, you know, we got therapists, now they use art therapy. They use in play therapy. They use so many types of therapy that was unknown 20 years ago, which certainly gives a child more what? More of an opportunity to develop normally, at least for everybody to know what the possibility if they get into college. And then we're supposed to have people at different levels of that person's development in college. We already have seen the results of ad adolescents on college campuses not being monitored. It's clear that the national research says one-fourth of every incoming freshman class drops out the first year, simply because they can't control the pressure, comorbidity, and other issues. So we don't have an excuse in America, if you would, to address the problem. It's our will. I just want to mention, and clearly I'm not a psychiatrist, it's a really bad idea for a judge to try and play psychiatrist. But I, I just want to second what Jenna said, and that is that we often see young people in their late teens and early 20s being diagnosed with bipolar disorder or with schizophrenia, and that seems to be a very common time for those illnesses really to develop. But mental illness can come in at any time during your life. Um, and I, I especially want to emphasize how important it is for a woman who's just had a child to make sure that she does not have postpartum depression for a certain percentage of women. And, and hopefully it's a pretty small percentage, but um, we often see that those women uh, really become mentally ill. And we all know what happened, for example, in the Andrea Yates case, a very extreme example. But I have another woman that we saw who's now in the state hospital who attempted to drown her baby. And of course, the baby will never recover. The brain damage was so severe. Also, some women, I think, as they go through menopause, develop a mental illness. And um, not to speak as, a, as somebody who's highly trained, but I think um, that the estrogen helps protect women from schizophrenia. And so consequently, um, they can develop schizophrenia later in life. So just because somebody's been mentally healthy most of their life, that doesn't mean that they cannot develop a mental illness. And so we all have to be alert to that. It can happen at any time. So. Thank you. I just have a question. Um, we're naming the diseases. We're talking about the schizophrenia and the bipolar. What are the symptoms? I'm pretty sure that a lot of people out there are saying, what symptoms should I look for, whether or not it's my child, whether or not it's my family member, um, whatever. Any behavior that is beyond the norm, and I'm saying that literally because most parents, family members, recognize the norm in their child. And when I say norm, I'm speaking about from that child's birth all the way up to the first developmental signs where you can recognize everything that's normal about the child. Anytime a child at the smallest level, if you notice, most people say when they tell a child if you've been, if somebody has touched you, that's why they tell you, because the child's behavior changes. And you've got to be able to understand that. I don't care if the child is two or three or four years old. If you've said something to the child and the child has been touched, most times some of these abuse cases start from people that's in the family. It's not somebody who's a stranger, it's a person in the family. Then all of a sudden when you get ready to deal with the child, the child is acting out that behavior. When you see those signs, you need to automatically identify something is wrong. As grandmama used to say, everybody got a sixth sense. As a child matures and grows up, you know how these young teenagers become, hello, their behavior changes, their dress changes. You can smell, you have to use what we say in therapy, your five senses. Don't act like you smell something. Don't act like they've been, they've been doing something and then all of a sudden you say, but what is that I smell? It ain't normal. Hello. Well, it might, you might not know what weed smell like, but it's somebody in your family know what weed smell like. And then this idea when they have, act in our behavior like Pastor Nash said in school, one of the most identifiable places that children act out behavior is in school environments, elementary all the way up. 
I have one more question too, I'm sorry. Um, I'm blessed, I have health insurance. So if something happens with my son or whatever, we can go see a therapist or whomever. What about people who are indigent or have no health insurance? What is it that they can do? Thank you, and unfortunately this is a common question that we probably get five to 10 times a day. MHMRA was probably the number one resource that we would recommend. However, with all the funding, it's difficult right now to even access MHMRA services. What we tell people as optional solutions that don't have insurance and can't get on the MHMRA's eligibility list is to definitely connect with people in NAMI and other support groups where you can get that personal lived experience. Unfortunately, we are not psychiatrists, we're not psychologists, we are family members, we are consumers that have mental illness. However, we know that support is extremely important for someone that's in recovery as well as education. So we always try to connect people. And I do want to recognize a few people that are here today that are from NAMI. These are some of our trained teachers and facilitators. Um, Gary Eagleton over here at the very front. Um, he, he's a person that people can go to. Angelina Brown Hudson, who's standing in line. And then we have two famous teachers right here on the very front row that have been working really hard in Sunnyside community as well, Eileen Chappelle and Barbara Sewell. These are people that at all, <clears throat> these are my NAMI champions. These are the people that I work with, that when people have questions, when they have concerns, that I refer to them because they have been through many of the situations that people are calling us about. But yes, insurance is the number one problem. That's why we're here as advocates, because we can do things that the state employees can't do, that some of the county employees can do. We can call representatives, we can call legislators, and we can give them an earful. And that's what we do. So whatever concerns, whatever you need, please let us know, because as advocates, we work for the people. Good evening, my name is Versi Green, and I uh, just kind of have two questions. One, to the judge. Um, is there a process in place for people that come to your court that may, you may not know that they're mentally ill? Is there an evaluation process in place to evaluate people that you may think have a mental illness besides the one that you know have a mental illness? And if there's a process in place, are there any goals or long-term goals that will help them instead of them going back out on the streets? And we call them orange sheets because in the old days we realized that if you printed them out on orange paper uh, with all the stuff on the judge's bench, you could spot them really quickly. So they're still called orange sheets even though most of the time they're now on white paper. And every morning when I come to court, for everybody who's in custody, there's what we call an orange sheet. And it lists that person's diagnosis and the medications they're on. When the jail pharmacy um, prescribes the, the medication, it automatically is printed by computer on the sheet. And then the doctor has to write it up and enter it. So we have some idea at the very first court appearance, if they've had enough time to see the psychiatrist after booking, what their diagnosis is. If they have been a patient of MHMRA or if they have been hospitalized at NPC, the Neuropsychiatric Center, or at HCPC, the Harris County Psychiatric Center, those automatically show up. Now, if a person has not yet been diagnosed, or if they have a private doctor, or if they've come from another jurisdiction um, out of state, then we would not have that information. It's very important as a family member um, when you come to court, um, especially if you have a child with intellectual disabilities, that you bring those ARD records from the school, or you bring your child's medications, or you bring a report from the doctor, um, get a release, so that if it's not already in the system, then we can go ahead and be aware of that. Because oftentimes the person with mental illness um, won't tell us. And does everybody know what 1244A is? 1244A is a special part of the law that allows a defendant to serve a misdemeanor sentence on a felony conviction. So you have someone here, let's say I know from the orange sheet that this person's bipolar. They're charged with possession less than a gram or possession one to four grams. And I say, wouldn't you like a probation? We have a wonderful program called New Start where you can meet with the doctors and the counselors. Uh, we will get you substance abuse treatment there or somewhere else. And they say, oh no, I want 1244A time. I want to do my 30 days. And I'll get treatment when I get out. 
And so it's very important. Uh, we used to have mental health specialists in the courtroom and they could explain to people why it's so important and get them excited about the treatment. And we try to do that as well, but I'm not as good as a lot of the caseworkers. So the only other thing we could do is get a psychiatric evaluation, but when we get the mental health court really going, we will have a psychiatrist who can do evaluations. Thank you. Does that answer your question?